I want you to take your Bibles real quickly tonight, and uh, I, I'm going to give you something. Just try to challenge your heart with it, and something God's put on my heart. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 1 tonight. Genesis chapter number 1. And find your place there. When you do, you stand to your feet all over the house. And Brother Jordan, would you mind coming up here and you pray for us tonight uh, before we preach? I'm going to read my scripture, and then I'm going to let you have a seat. And uh, Brother Tyler, I'm going to put him on this blue and let him pray right after I read the scripture. Uh, Genesis chapter number 1. You're not going to have to go to your concordance or go far in your Bible to find Genesis 1. I'm going to read out of Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1, in the first book of the Bible. Now, if you can't find that, you just stand there and smile and don't worry about it. Uh, Somebody will be along to help you in a little while. Uh, But Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 1. Are you there? Say amen. amen. The Bible says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I want to stop and say I'm glad that the Bible does not start off by trying to defend the thought of God. In fact, it starts off as if the reader already believes that God already exists. And not only does He exist, but He's the one in charge. It's as if the reader already has to assume that God's in the driver's seat. Now, if that's true, if you believe that, now, there's a lot of people that do not believe that God created the heavens and the earth. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of professors who have really big degrees and really big classes and really big colleges who say that we all came from some little tadpole crawling out of a swamp. Listen, you got to have way more faith to believe that junk than you do that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It's not hard for me to trust that there's a big God who created all of this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you have a problem with that verse, and nobody here does, but just by way of live stream or anywhere else, you got a problem with that verse, then you will have a problem with the rest of the Bible. If you can't have faith to believe that God is the one in control, then you're going to struggle with everything else in life. But I put my faith in that God, that capital G-O-D God. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And watch this. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And watch this. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Say that verse with me. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. You can have a seat. Let's go ahead and pray. Pray for me. Lord, what a joy, an (coughs) honor, and a privilege it is to be in your house again tonight. God, I thank you, Lord, for meeting with us once again. (laughs) Yeah. God, it's nice to come into your house and feel your presence. Mm. God, this ain't happening everywhere. But God, I'm glad you showed up this week. God, God, I ask you, Lord, you continue to show up. God, you continue to move. Lord, do that only you can do. God, I pray for Brother Brent tonight as he stands behind your pulpit. God, as he stands behind your sacred desk. And God, he's just a man, and he cannot do it without you, Lord. And God, I ask the Lord you'd empty him of sin. God, you'd uh, fill him with your Holy Spirit, God. And God, you'd hide him behind the cross tonight. God, you'd help him preach. And God, I hope you make the preaching easy for him tonight, God. God, I pray, Lord, you'd illuminate his mind. Lord, you'd sure loose his tongue. And God, I hope that you just give him clarity of mind. God, you speak through him. And God, do that work which only you can do. Yeah. God, we'll love you. And we'll praise you for all that you do tonight. And we'll pray in the name of all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. I appreciate that. The Bible introduces us to God the Father himself. Then the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God, that's a capital S, Spirit of God, says that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now I want you to pay real close attention to that. I want to take that phrase and I want to preach a thought to you tonight. I believe that without a doubt, we need to see another move of God. I want to see another move of God. 
God was introduced to us in this chapter and God is not just some being that sits up on a throne and is uh, lackadaisical in our life. But God is always on the move. I believe that God is always a moving spirit. God does not stay still. And if God is moving, God does not expect His people to stand still, but His people ought to be willing to move with Him. I I don't bring revival. The preacher cannot bring revival. People themselves cannot bring revival. But it is the presence of an Almighty God that moves through the church house, moves on the life of people. I'm talking about anybody in the building tonight. It can be the youngest teenager or it can be the oldest saint of God. God still desires to move in our lives. And I want to tell you what we're seeing today in our churches and what we're seeing today on the streets of America and what we're seeing today in social media and on the television and what we're seeing today that's running rampant through our streets and the mindsets that's running through our communities and our children are dealing with it. We certainly need another move of God. We need God to move in our presence. We need God to move in our problems. We need God to do something that nobody else can do. We don't need a preacher to bring another message because we've got enough message messages that we've heard that we ain't even doing at the time anyway. We don't need another ministry to start itself and to be on the forefront of everything and surprise us at how good they are at their programs or their plaudits or their platforms. What we need is we need the very presence of God in our ministries. We need the presence of God in our messages. We need the presence of God in our marriages, in our our homes. We need another move of God. Tonight I will preach from that thought. We need a move of God. Now I want to tell you when God moved the first time in Scripture, it sets the precedence of how God will move next in Scripture. And on and on it sets the program or the process of how God moves. So anytime you see something mentioned for the first time in the Bible, always stay there. Pay attention to it. And so God introduces us to how the Spirit of God moved. If we're going to have revival today, it's going to be because God chose to move. Like the writer of the hymn said, all is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. And I want to tell you, the wind of God, the Spirit of God is like the wind. It blows where it listeth. G. Campbell Morgan said it like this. He said, man cannot bring a briefcase in and expect to bring revival. He said, men cannot get together and hold sets of meetings and expect to bring revival. But what happens is we put up our sails to God and the holy wind of God blows through our presence and He carries us where we need to go. Tonight in our marriages. Tonight in our minds. Tonight in our ministry. Tonight in our homes. What we need is we need to throw up our sails and say, God, move in my life or move me out of the way. Listen, if you don't want to see revival, then you just sit there and just enjoy yourself tonight. But the rest of us, we want to see revival. We're expecting to see God move. We're asking God. I'm petitioning God to move. I like to provoke God to move. I want to see God move one more time. I believe He can do it. If you believe that, say amen. I have to believe that because the only hope my children have of knowing the presence of God is when God moves. The only hope for my marriage is when God moves. The only hope for our communities is when God moves. I want to tell you something. When God chooses to move, uh, crack houses start to bankrupt. When God chooses to move, uh, bars start shutting down. When God chooses to move, marriages are put back together again and homes are helped. You don't believe me? Walk through the pages of 
of the gospel and watch as Jesus moved into every city. He did not leave it like he found it. I'm talking about a God that walked into a graveyard one day and everybody there just as dead as they can be. But you can't get death around the giver of life and death stay long. All of a sudden, that which had been dead got up and started moving again. You know why? Because God moved and people move when God moves. I want to see the altars full again. I want to see our hearts full again. I want to see God move. I need God to move again. And I'm thankful that we have the Word of God that tells us that God is a Spirit who is always on the move. Our churches are growing stagnant because we've stopped seeing God move. Our churches are growing cold because we've stopped seeing God move. You say, my fire's going out, preacher. My fire's dying down. One day I put a fire out at my house and I thought it was just smoldering and smoking. But a big old wind kind of sweeped over that fire that had gone out that I had put out with all my might and power tried to put that fire out. But you know what? When that wind blew by, what I tried to put out blazed up again. The devil's doing his dead level best to put the fire out of some Christians. He's doing everything he can He's happy when you're just smoldering. He's happy when you're just sitting there watching everybody else burn on for the glory of God. But I've seen some people who've just put it on cruise control and they're good, they're fine with the smoldering smoke of what used to be. But then let the wind of God blow through our church services and all of a sudden those people that had grown cold and dead, all of a sudden they catch fire again and they feel what they used to feel for God I'm here to tell you what we need is we need God to blow through our churches again oh what we need is we need another move of God I want you to see this first of all tonight I want you to see the condition of where God moved and here's my prayer my prayer is at the end of this sermon Everybody will be at the altar coming down not because I asked you to, not because I beckoned you to, and not because somebody else in your pew did it. But if you have a deep desire to want to see God move, not on everybody else around you, but in you personally, I'm asking you already, why don't you find a place at this altar? You say, preacher, I need God to move. But I'm not sure God wants to move. And I sure would like to know that God really does want to move in my life. Maybe God's already bypassed me. Maybe God don't want to do anything in my life. Well, I'm glad you came tonight. Hold on, honey. Buckle your seatbelt. Because I'm about to tell you where God likes to move and how God likes to move and why God likes to move. And it puts every single last one of us in the same category. We're unworthy. We're unworthy at best. Sure don't deserve God to move. But I'm glad God's not expecting me to get all my ducks in a row in order for Him to move. I believe that God can move anywhere, anytime, at any moment. And I'm expecting God will do it this week. I want to see God move. Lord, we need you to move again. I want you to see, first of all, the condition of where he moved. The condition of where he moved. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. Verse number two says, And the earth was without form. Notice that, just for a second. The earth was without form. You know what that means? It means that everything you see today in the world was not put together. Everything you see in the world was not what was taking place at this time. There were no mountains put together with the valleys. 
There was no grandeur of the oceans as they crashed upon the shores. There was nothing beautiful to behold about this earth. There was no rhyme or reason to it. You couldn't look at the landscape at the earth at this time and see anything that would behold you to see beauty. You couldn't see anything. In fact, it was complete dark and there was nothing put together. There was no trees growing in their green leaves growing up out of the ground. In fact, there were no seeds yet that was coming up out of the ground. There was no green grass to show. There was no corn in the fields. There was nothing to behold a beauty. The Bible says that the earth was without form. Now I said all that to say this. I'm glad that God does not move in places and expect places to be put together like they ought to be. God doesn't wait for everything to come together like it should be. God doesn't wait for rhyme or reason. God doesn't wait for format or a fixation or a fashion in order to move. But even when things are out of place, even when things don't make any sense, even when things have no fashion, they have no form, God still chooses to move. That's not helping y'all, so let me help myself. I remember a day when my life was not put together. I remember a day when I had no rhyme or reason to my life. But out steps from glory a man named Jesus. And even when I had no reason to live, even when I had no hope and no help, and there was nothing of my life that was of any beauty, God stepped in. God moved and changed everything. The earth was without form. The condition of where He moved was not a condition that's conducive to what you feel in here tonight. And if He chose to move back there like that, what makes you think He can't move in your life? Without form. Watch this. Not only does the Bible say the earth was without form, but then the Bible says it was void. Void. That means that that word void means of no worth. There were no gold in the mountains because there were no mountains. There was no silver dug in the earth because there was no earth to hold the silver. There was no worth of any kind to this world at all. If you ever wrote a check back in the day, we don't do it no more. We just swipe cards. But back in the day, we used to write checks, me and my wife. And at the end of the month, they would send back those checks to you. And notice, they would have something written across it. Does anybody remember that's got gray hair? Remember what it used to say? It said void. You know what that means? It means that at one time, that check was worth something. At one time, you paid a bill with that check because it had some worth to it. Maybe it was a doctor bill that you wrote out and you paid for. Maybe it was the water bill at your house and you wrote it out. Maybe you was buying groceries and you wrote out $120 for all the groceries for a week or two weeks. And because at one time, that piece of paper may have had some value, but when it was written void over it, it had no value you at all. In fact, you couldn't even get the worth of the paper out of it. It wasn't even worth the paper that it was written on. That was void and it was worthless. Not only was the world without form, but the earth was worthless. You say, preacher, why are you still sweating and still hollering and spitting all over the second row? Here's why. Because I remember when God found me, my life had no worth to it. I wasn't even worth the very body that I was walking around in. I was of little worth. I had no value. I had no rhyme. I had no reason. And there was nobody would desire my life. I was worth nothing to nobody as a gut rot sinner. But he still chose to move anyway. Have you ever felt like God puts up way more with us than we are worth. 
You ever wonder why God, I, I look at Him sometimes and I think, you saved me and I'm thankful for it. But to be honest with you, I think you got the raw end of the deal because I get your glory, I get your goodness, I get your grace, I get all that and half the time I take it for granted and I sure can't reciprocate everything that I get to receive. And I look at God and say many times, I sure am worth, I'm, I sure am not worth worth the trouble that I put you through to have to put up with me but you know what it doesn't matter any prayer I pray like that God don't look at me and say you know what you're right I don't want to put up with you no more you're out of the family you're out of the ball game you're thrown under the bus get out I'm glad he doesn't throw broken clay away I'm glad he doesn't throw broken vessels away I'm glad when I'm no worth and I have little value to my life he still loves me anyway and he'll still move in my life little value worthless it was void not only was it without form and void but darkness was upon the face of the deep darkness and we're not talking about the darkness that you like at your house when you go to sleep because we like a little bit of light but I'm talking about utter darkness. There was no sun to shine. There were no stars in the sky. We're talking about utter darkness. Utter darkness. There's not much you can do with it. You can't operate in it. One day I, I felt like I had the layout of my house just right. So that if I woke up in the middle of the night... And I wanted to go get a snack or I just wanted to walk around the house. I had it so dark that you really couldn't see anything. But I knew the layout of the land and everything was okay. Until that one right there moved furniture on me. <laughs> and as long as you can learn your way around, you're alright. But when somebody starts moving furniture on you, it will mess everything up. If you can't see where you're going, I remember one night I stumbled over a coffee table that had been placed in another place and I fell for 30 minutes trying to grab hold and get my balance back. I was trying not to wake everybody, but the awfulest racket you ever heard in your life, do you know why? Because if you can't see where you're going, there is no functionality to your life. Well, some of us have learned how to maneuver through the darkness, but let God start moving the furniture on you. Let other things happen in your life that kind of rearrange your life. Let, let you get a pink slip from your job. Let you have to go through a valley that you didn't think you was going to have to go through. Let you have to go through some. And when the furniture gets rearranged, the darkness is not of any worth to you. You can't operate in it. I want to tell you something. When the earth was without any light and it was dark, there was no use to it at all. You can't operate in it. I remember my life being the same way. Couldn't operate, couldn't maneuver, couldn't do anything in it. Just utter darkness. People in Alaska, people up north, they go through 24 or 48 hours of total darkness. They have some light, but do you know when that darkness, they go through, the sun don't shine for 48 hours, 72 hours. They say the highest suicide rate is during those times of darkness. Do you know why most people are living miserable? Because they're living in a place of darkness. You know why people take their lives? Because they're living in places of darkness. You know why people sit... I'm even talking about Christians. Church members. Close to the light, but still living in darkness. Miserable. I've met Christians who look like they're the most miserable people on the earth. Yep. And meanest too. Yep. And I think, what in God's name is wrong with these people? If you have the light and you're walking in the light, you ain't got nothing to be sorry about. Amen. You ain't got nothing to be worried about. You don't have anything to be miserable about. You know why? Darkness always brings Miserable circumstances. <laughs> but yet, 
he still chose to move anyway in dark places. Tonight, I don't know what you're going through and I don't know what you're facing, but God wants to move in your condition. You say, you don't know my condition, preacher. You don't know what my house is like, preacher. You don't know what my mom and daddy is like, preacher. You don't know what my lifestyle's been like, preacher. No, I don't. But God does. And you know what? The Spirit of God's going to follow you home. And if you let Him, He wants to move in your life. I told you just a little bit ago, I'm going to invite you to this altar and I want you to ask Him, God, like you moved there. I've been sitting here trying to put all the pieces together and make all the pieces fit. But even when I don't know how to do that, if you move back then in that condition, God, will you move in my condition? And I'm here to tell you, He's a God that will. I remember preaching as a kid in college. I, I loved to preach. I wanted to preach. I wanted to go everywhere God let me go. And I remember <clears throat> I struggled with preachers not calling me to go preach. Brother Jeff, I wanted them to call me. I felt like God was giving me sermons in those dorm rooms that somebody needed to hear. I felt like somebody's got to hear these sermons. God's given them to me, so there's a people out there that needs to hear this. And I, 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 I love to preach. Anywhere they let me preach, I'd go. I'd go to jails. I'd go anywhere. I'd go preach on the street. I go preach in a pasture and a bunch of cows if they let me. I didn't care. I just wanted to preach. And I remember my pastor asked me, buddy, I was so fired up to go preach and I wanted to preach so bad. My pastor came to me and he said, hey, I got somewhere I want you to go. And I said, where is it? Tell me the church and I'll go. He said, it's not a church. And I said, where do you want me to go? He said, There's a group of about 60, 70 men downtown. He said, they're at a rescue mission. He said, I want you to go preach to them. And on a Wednesday night, I got my stuff together. and Boy, I was fired up about the sermon I had, and I was just going to let them have it. And he said, when you go down there, it's not going to be like going and preaching at a church. He said, you're going down there and you're going to preach to crack addicts. He said, when you go down there, you're going to preach to men that have a problem with alcoholism. He said, you're going to preach to men who have no home. They have nowhere to... Many of them have lost their families because of the sin they've been living in. He said, and many of them ain't going to want to listen to what you've got to say. He said, but you give them Jesus anyway. And I went down there and I, I had a sermon that I wanted to preach. And When I walked in that door, I watched those men sitting there. and Man, they just eat up with life and just miserable... But I could see it on their faces. You could smell it on them. Sin had taken hold of their life. And I thought to myself, Lord, I can't help these men. I've never been where they are. How in the world am I going to help them? And I never will forget it. God in that moment, and I, I, as, as you're looking me straight in the face, God looking me in the face, I'll never forget that moment when I said, God, my sermon ain't going to help them. I've never been where they are. And he spoke this to me. He said, no, you haven't, but I have. I know where they've been. He said, and if you give them you, you ain't going to help them. But if you give them me, I've got all they'll ever need. I stood up and boy, I stumbled through it. And I remember stumbling through it and I struggled. Boy, worst job I ever had. All that pride of wanting to preach had gone out the window. Halfway through that sermon, big man, he was about seven foot eight, 380 pounds, stood up right in the middle of it. And he said, hey! I stopped and I did what some of y'all just did. (laughs) My eyes that big. He said, you believe what you're saying? I said, I I think I do. I'm pretty sure. What do you think? He said, I said, do you believe what you're saying? And all of a sudden, a holy boldness rose up in me. And I looked at him and I said, sir, 
if I didn't believe what I was saying, I wouldn't be here tonight preaching it to you. I believe that Jesus can save anywhere, anybody, anywhere, at any time. And he looked at me and he said, Son, if you believe that, then I believe it too. And I'll trust him. And I said, if you'll trust him, won't you kneel down right here? And he did. And about five of his other friends came down and knelt. And they all asked Jesus to come in their heart. And in that moment, I realized, you know what? My mission is not to just go find the wealthiest and the best looking. My mission is not to preach the gospel to the people who are well and don't need a physician. But my mission is to find the people whose lives have been busted up. And listen, there's a lot of people we get to preach to. And buddy, they don't need my preaching because I can't help them. Their lives are so put together. Everything's perfect. But God didn't send me to go preach to those people. You know who God sent me to preach to? He sent me to preach to those who are captive. Those who are busted up. Those whose lives have been broken. Those who've been hassled by hell. It's us to preach the gospel to those who are bruised, battered, and hell itself has ravaged their life. That's who I want to preach to. The conditions are not conducive with God moving, but He moves anyway. I sure do love a God that will do that. The condition of where He moved. I want you to see this, and I'm going to close it real quickly. Not only the condition of where He moved, but I want you to see the character by which He moved. The character by which He moved. I start, Brother Jeff, I started looking this word up. The Bible says that the Spirit of God moved. That word moved in the Hebrew is the word rakoff. Right there where it says the Spirit of God moved. If you look that word up, it's translated from a word that means rakoff. And the word rakoff in the Hebrew literally is interpreted as like a mother hen broods over a nest. Or a mother hen would sit on a nest. My mother and my father, I just stopped by there today. They, after I left, they got chickens and they got a goat and they got a pig and they've got a farm there in Cowpens. I guess if you live in Cowpens, you've got to have a farm. So they got all that stuff. One day I arrived at their house and my mama loves them chickens. She buys all kinds of ugliest things God ever created, but the best tasting you've ever had. Amen. Chickens were not made to fly, they are made to fry. Amen? Yeah. But she won't let me eat them. For some reason, they become pets to her. But them hens will lay. And them hens will sit on them eggs. And, and I remember I got there one day and them hens was just a cackling and a hollering and I said, what in God's name is wrong with your chickens? Something's in there getting them. She said, they're broody. I never heard that before. I said, they're what? She said, they're re- very broody. And I said, broody, okay. She said, those hens want to sit on those, on those eggs And the truth of the matter is, is those eggs need for that mama hen to sit on them or they'll die. Now here's the thing. That hen don't need anything from them eggs. She don't need nothing at all. Those eggs don't give her anything. That mother hen could exist without those eggs. But those eggs couldn't exist without that hen. (laughs) About to have me a fit. And that mama hen will sit on those eggs. And inside those eggs, the development of those baby chicks inside the eggs, though on the outside they don't look anything like a chicken, but inside there is a development that goes on. And the development hinges on whether or not those hens sit on that egg. You know what that means? If that mother hen didn't move on those eggs or brood, over those eggs they would be cut short of the development that was going on inside of that eggs but because that mama hen wants to sit on there and loves to sit on there and with a heart she's made up her mind that nothing will stop her from sitting on if she was more preoccupied with everything going on around her then those eggs would die if she was caught up with everything 
everything else that was going on in her little pen and in her little world, those eggs would die. But that mama hen is so focused and laser sight is focused on making sure that the development of those eggs are true and real, that she sits on them and nothing will move her off of those eggs. Preacher, why are you shouting? Because I remember the day that God moved in my life and He didn't do it because He had to. He did it because He wanted to. And I want to tell you, I didn't give anything to God. God would have existed without me. But when God moved and God sat down in my life, then it changed me. It developed me. It is continuously moving and changing who I am. I don't give anything to Him. But without Him, I would not exist. Without Him, I couldn't preach. Without Him, I couldn't function. But I'm glad though I don't offer Him anything. He offers me everything. Everything.